Now in this video, we're going to talk about the second big thing you need to know from the pre-APUSH meeting, and that's how we take notes in this class. So, first of all, we're going to set up our paper like this, and I bet you know why. Because we do Cornell notes in APUSH. And I bet you know some things about the structure of Cornell notes. Like I bet you know that this particular section right here, the big one, is for your notes. Everybody knows that's the notes section where you're going to go righty, 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 all the way down the page. Well, here's something you might not know, and I hope it shows up nicely on the screen. It showed up really well in the Google Meet when I was sharing the screen, but you missed that. Ah. So if you can't read what that says, um, you have to use the headings and the subheadings that the book gives when you take your notes. Every time they give you, you know, that great big blue bold ink or that great big blue uh, uh, italicized stuff that they have that breaks up the sections, well, you have to write all those down clearly in your notes. There's two big reasons and they both relate to the same thing. You being able to find information in your notebook as quickly as we can. And so we're going to say things like, everybody turn to the section called Hamilton's Financial Plan. Well, if you didn't use the subject headings, you're going to be going flippy, flippy, flippy trying to find what we're talking about. But if you write down the subject headings, you'll be able to turn there very quickly and we'll all be on the same page. Get it? On the same page. Yeah, I know. Awful joke. So that part is pretty clear except for the subheading part, which you need to know. And now you know that. So the second part may not be so clear because if I said to you, what do you use the left hand column for? you might give a different answer based on the kind of teacher that you've had. Because the Cornell note system does allow flexibility for the left-hand column. So for example, in something maybe particularly like a science class that happens to be vocabulary heavy, they might tell you put your vocabulary in the left-hand column. For something like a math class, they might tell you keep track of any equations or mathematical symbols in the left-hand column. They can be used for different things. Well, this is APUSH. And first of all, it's not AP Gov, it's AP US History. So it's not the same kind of class that you probably took last year if you're taking this class. See, AP US History is called narrative. What that means is it's a story and it's got lots of little stories inside the story. And lots of those little stories have tiny stories inside the little stories. It's just story, 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 story. And stories have beginnings and they have middles and they have turning points and they have ends. Whereas something like AP Gov was not like that. That's called expository. It means you explain how something works. You explain what something is. And then you move to something else that you explain how it works and you explain what it is. Some of those explanations might have stories in them that make them clearer, but you don't tell a story of the US government. You cover one branch and explain it and then you go to the next branch and explain it and then, so that's expository. But a push is narrative. And one of the things we know when people read narrative style stuff, it's pretty much when they read anything, but it's especially when they read narrative style stuff. We're all talking to ourselves in our head as we read. That as we're reading the author's words, when something strikes us, we like quickly say something to ourselves in our head. Well, I call that head talk and you're going to put your head talk in this left-hand column. What we basically mean is when you're saying stuff to yourself in your head, we want you to record what you're saying. Like, write it down. Like you go along and one of the most classic examples is a question that comes up in your head as you're reading. Well, why did that happen? Well, why did that person do that? Well, how come? Well, write them down. If a question like that occurs to you, that's one kind of head talk. 
but it's not the only kind of head talk. Maybe a connection comes up to you where you can go, oh, well, that kind of fits with something else I already know. Oh, that can connect to something I learned in another class or whatever kind of connections you can make. Maybe it's going to bring up insights for you, observations that you can make about something that you've read and you go, oh, well, I think such and such and such and such. Okay, great, fine, wonderful. Write it down. There's all kinds of different things like memories. Did you catch me having to check my own slide? Um, maybe you have been to a place that um, they're talking about. Maybe you have already heard the story because maybe your seventh grade teacher told you about it or maybe your grandfather told you about it or something along those lines. If they bring back memories to you, that's another great form of head talk or pretty much anything that you say to yourself in your head. We want you to record those thoughts. We want you to write them down in the left-hand column of your Cornell notes. Now, you might think you know what comes next in Cornell notes. You might think that once you righty, righty, righty with a little head talk and then righty, righty some more with some more head talk and once you get down to the bottom of the page, you might think that you're gonna do your summary at the bottom of the page. You're not. Now don't get me wrong, I didn't just tell you you're not doing summaries. You are gonna do summaries all year long. But the Cornell note system has a trick to it that most of the bang for the buck comes from. And a lot of people don't know about it. Once you get to the end of your notes, you walk away from your notes. Like you literally leave them. You close your notebook and do something else. You walk away. Maybe you go have dinner. Maybe you go to play a video game. Maybe you go to, I don't know, do something with friends. You walk away from your notes. Like maybe you go to bed and go to sleep and get up the next day. And then maybe during this Eagle time period we're gonna have in the fall, or maybe during a study hall if you have one, or maybe before school sitting on the floor in the hallway or at lunch or whatever. That's when you do the summary section at the bottom of the page. Now you might say to yourself, well, uh, but then I'm not really gonna remember the stuff that I wrote. That's exactly right. And you say, well, then isn't my summary gonna be bad? No, it shouldn't be. Because the way you're gonna summarize is by rereading all your notes like they're a book on US history that was written just by you. And you're gonna reread what you wrote word for word, checking out the little head talk that you already wrote. And as you are rereading your own notes, if any new head talk occurs to you, you're gonna write it down. You're gonna add it to the head talk you already have in the column. And that's gonna refresh your memory about what you read, and it's gonna give you a much clearer view of the big, most important things for a summary. Because you're looking for the biggest, most important things on the page to put down in the summary section. So for example, it's not a good use of Cornell notes in the left-hand column to tell people they need to put the main points there. It wouldn't be a good idea in my class to tell people to put the subject headings there because those are supposed to go in your notes. The main points are gonna go down in your summary section. And we're gonna talk about what we mean by that in the next video.